All righty. Good morning, everybody. All right, it's a joy to be with you another week. So we're diving back into our study on the incomprehensible love of Jesus, uh, which we see in the book of Ephesians. Before we get into the passage, we'd love to just pray with you. Lord, we come before you and we thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you, Lord, to enjoy you, to pour out our hearts to you because you poured out your heart for us. Lord, you, you overwhelm us because of how incredible your love is. There are no words, no amount of time that we could spend or use that would be able to fully explain how incredible your love for us is. Lord, I pray that you would help us to deeper grasp it today, that our lives would be more transformed by it, so that we can go out into this world not with just our own abilities or uh, speaking skills or ability to argue or, or prove points, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, changed, transformed, captivated by your love, and filled up with you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Are you content to live an ordinary life? No. Great. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Are you content to live an ordinary life? I think most of us would say no. But practically, if we were to really look at the way that we live our lives, what we focus on, what we do day by day, would our life show that we're content? to live an ordinary life? Or would you rather live an extraordinary, an extraordinary life, a supernatural life, a life that looked at by others is easily described as otherworldly? I think it's easy to get stuck in our Christian walk and just kind of skate along, complacent to do our thing Sunday by Sunday and just hope for the best. But Jesus calls us to more than that. He, he calls us to radical life transformation, radical life redirection so that we might be changed and so that others might be changed as God works through us and that they might be changed not just for now, but forever. Something Ryan said at a staff meeting some months ago has stuck with me. He says, the only thing that is going to last forever is the cross and the impact that it makes. Are we investing our lives in what is going to last eternally? Or are we content to spend our money, our time, on things that are just for now? Pastor Bob, at a few funerals I've heard him speak, has said this. He says, each one of us has a day that we were born and a day that we will pass on that will be written on our tombstone. For me, it would read, Stephen Anderson, born into this world in 1992, went home to be with the Lord, question mark, tonight, a year from now, 40 years from now, don't know. But it's what is in between those two years that really, or those two sets of years that is really what matters. It's the dash. What are you doing? What will you do with your dash? You see, when that day comes and we go home to be with the Lord as believers or go into judgment, if we are unbelievers, each one of us will have a funeral where our, our closest family and friends will share what our life consisted of, what we remember them by. What will people say about you? Will they pour out their hearts about how they saw Jesus in you, how he through you, radically impacted their lives. We must not be content to live an ordinary life. Jesus calls us to more than that, and he gives us the power 
through his Holy Spirit to live an extraordinary, supernatural, otherworldly life so that when people see you, they need to know what is different because they know they don't have it if they don't have Christ. In your workplace, in your school, somebody might come and say, what is it? Why are you different? What do you have that I don't because I need it? And your answer can be exactly what Paul is praying for the Ephesians and is praying for us. Jesus saved me. My life is built on the foundation of his love. He has transformed my life radically. It was going one direction. He changed the direction, and it's going another now. He has captivated me by his love and, and changed me by his love in the Christian community that I've been a part of as I've, as I've loved them and they've loved me and I've learned to better understand his love for me. And as a result, the person you're seeing today is not just me. Jesus is in me and is living through me. That is the extraordinary life we want to live. That is the life Paul wants us to live. And so last week... Our thesis statement was this. We, we looked over the whole passage and said this. Jesus wants to transform our lives so that we can know his love and become more like him. In order to give us just a short few minutes of review, I'd love to just read the beginning of this passage again with you in Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14, says this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Paul bows before God in prayer, knowing that he is the source of all change. And he says, I am begging the Father to give you the power to do what I am praying for you. That, according to the riches of his glory... He may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He says, I want you to be founded on his love. I want the spirit to radically transform your life. I want Jesus to be the permanent resident in your heart at the control panel, directing you, guiding you, leading you. And remember, last week as well, I said these things build upon each other. It's not like, uh, I want this, and as well, if you could, I'd, I'd enjoy this being a part of your life. And, and if we really get to it, this would be nice if this third thing is there. No, they all build on each other. He says, I want you to be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can understand, grasp the love of Jesus with the result that you are going to be filled up with the fullness of Christ. He is going to live through you and people are going to be changed through you. So today we're going to start diving into the incomprehensible, limitless love of Christ. Let's remind ourselves of what point one was so that we can build on it as we dive into point two. Last week... Our first point was by the power of the Spirit, Jesus wants to radically transform and redirect our lives. Now here's the so that, which is where we're going in point two this morning. So that we can understand, experience, and live out his love in Christian community. So that we can understand experience, and live out his love in Christian community. Look with me at verse 17. He says, that you being rooted and grounded in love, remember we said last week as well, your life has to be founded on the love of Christ that he poured out for you on the cross. Without this, the rest of this passage is not able to happen in your life. Your life not only needs to be founded on Christ's love by believing in the gospel, but be deeply rooted in it so that your life is sustained by his love, empowered by his love, so that you bear fruit through his love. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Paul prays that they would have the strength to comprehend the love of Christ. 
Because without God's enabling, without giving you the capacity to grasp it, you cannot. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 1.18. He says, to the world, to those who are perishing, the message of the cross is foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross, what Jesus did on the cross to to save you, his pouring out of his love, the world thinks is foolishness because they can't understand it. Paul says in the next chapter, he says, the man without the spirit cannot accept the things which come from the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them. But to those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus and have seen our lives over and over again transformed, redirected, changed, we know that it is the very power of God poured out in our hearts. God has to enable us, strengthen us to grasp it. This word is kataliban in the Greek. It has the implication of of grasping with the head intellectually, but grasping with the hands as well, which means having a a practical understanding of it, being able to, to really put your hands around it and put it into play. Our ability to comprehend the incomprehensible love of Christ is only able to happen as we walk alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to really dive into this part of the passage after we look at what Paul is saying about the love of Christ. But I want you, if you don't get anything else from this sermon, to get this. Christian community is essential for your spiritual growth. If you want to be like Christ, you have to be with his people. If you want to better grasp the love of Christ, you have to be with his people. I hope that by the end of this, you'll see why Paul says that this is the case. But let's ask the question first. What is the love of Christ? Because he doesn't just say the love of God in general. He says the love of Christ. We see the New Testament speak about God's love in many different ways and in different categories. One of the most well-known verses in all of the scripture is what? John 3.16. For God, speaking of the Father, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So the Father's love often is is talked about in the Scripture as his giving of his Son. We see his love in what he was willing to give in order for us to be saved. We see our value in the Father's eyes based on what he was willing to lay down and how valuable the Son is. But when the love of the Son, Jesus, the love of the Christ, the Messiah, is spoken of, almost every time it talks about his self-sacrificial love demonstrated in his being poured out for us on the cross. His death on the cross. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If John 3.16 is the verse that most clearly demonstrates, speaks of the love of the Father in the Scripture, 1 John 3.16 might be up there for the love of the Son. 1 John 3.16 says this, By this we know love, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So we know love because of what Jesus did for us. Romans 5, 8, for God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Enemies, rebellious against God. No good in us that would ever merit being loved by the almighty creator of this universe who we have turned against. 
And yet God's perfect demonstration, eternal demonstration of his love is that he poured out his life for us on the cross. Paul asks us to take on this mindset, the franeo of Christ, the attitude, the outlook, the frame of thinking in Philippians 2 when he says we're to count others as more important than ourselves, consider the interests of others as more important than our own, because this is the mindset that was in Christ Jesus. Self-sacrifice, laying down our lives for one another because of what Jesus did for us. In the passage, we see two things. We see that the love of Christ is limitless, and the love of Christ is beyond comprehension. Let's look at the first one. In this passage, Paul says that we might be strengthened to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ. Let's talk about syntax really quick. Let's talk about sentence structure. You see that and there, breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ? It's actually not in the original Greek. It's really interesting. Almost all commentators interpret the breadth and length and height and depth and love of Christ to be the same, but in almost every English translation, the and makes it seem like they're two different things. These are parallel infinitive statements, to do this, to do this. He says, I want you to grasp the height, depth, length, breadth, to know the love of Christ. He's saying the same thing in two different ways. So let's break this down. The love of Christ is limitless. He says, I want you to know the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. Now, when I think about dimensions, I think length, width, and height. What is this breadth thing? He says it like this. He says the breadth. This is as far as it goes east and as far as it goes west. How far is the east from the west? Never ends. The height? Go as high up as you can into the heavens. That's how far the love of Christ stretches. Go as far down the depths into the the core of the earth, and, and further on into the endlessness of the universe. That's how far the depth of the love of Christ is. But that just puts it on one plane. He says now, the length of it as well. So the love of Christ is inescapable. Throughout all of history, all of eternity, there's nowhere you can hide from the love of Christ. David says something similar in Psalm 139. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, height, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the underworld, depths, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, sun rises in the east. Or dwell in the remotest part of the sea, the Mediterranean Sea is to the west. If you're going from Israel towards Spain, even there, your hand will lead me and your right hand will watch over me. God's presence is inescapable, which for a believer is comforting. For somebody who does not know God and who has not been forgiven by him, this is terrifying. Because he knows everything. But as a believer, God knows everything and yet loves you the same because he has paid the price for your sins to be covered. His love is inescapable. We cannot outrun it. It's infinitely greater than we could ever comprehend or perceive. Something to me that is incredible, too, is this is an essential part of his character. God doesn't just love as it's something he does. He is love. It is who he is. I like to think of myself as, as at least a, a person who's, who's moderately good at loving others. My wife could probably argue that on my worst days, right? But I am not love internally in my character. I fail. I fall short. God is love. There is never an instant throughout all of eternity where he has ceased to be loving nor is there a second in your entire life where he has ceased to be loving towards you.
So do you grasp the expanse of his love? And in response to his love, or as a consequence of his love, do you grasp the expanse of his loving plan of salvation? God's desire is that all men would come to a knowledge of the truth, turn from their sin, believe in Christ, and be saved. Do you believe that? If you have come to know Christ as your Savior, you have experienced his relentless, pursuing, seeking love. In Matthew 9, we see that God is not looking for the picture-perfect people. Hey, get your life together, figure your stuff out, and then come and talk to me. That's not the God we serve. While we were yet sinners... Paul says Christ died for us. So in Matthew 9, when Jesus, after he heals the paralytic man, in in order to show he has authority to forgive sin, people are saying, goodness, only God can do this. Indeed, Jesus is God. He walks out of the house, and then where does he go? Do you remember? Immediately after he walks out of the house where he heals the paralytic man to prove he can forgive sins, he goes over to the tax collecting booth of Matthew. You can imagine people are sitting there saying, man, he can forgive sin? How much? How much sin? What kind of person is he willing to forgive? Is it the religious person? Is it any person? Who is he willing to forgive? And Jesus walks over to the tax-collecting booth of Matthew and Capernaum, who would have been considered the worst or one of the worst sinners in the entire city. He says, that's who I'm looking for. Because Jesus did not come to seek those who perceived themselves as righteous, who thought they had it all together, but those who understood that they were not righteous, the sinner. Not the one who perceived themselves as being physically well, but the sick. But the thing is, we have to recognize that that is our condition. Jesus comes to seek and save the lost, not the perfect, because they don't exist. The love of Jesus is beyond comprehension. It is beyond our knowing but he says he wants us to know it. And last week as I was reading through this passage, uh, I was walking around in the neighborhood around here, and then I went over by the Cal Sag, and, and so water was on my mind as I'm, as I'm meditating on this passage. And I walked past a little stream. It, it couldn't have been more than six inches deep. And I could see every single rock that was at the bottom of this stream, every blade of grass, little fish that swims by. And I could describe for you perfectly what was at the surface of this water right underneath it. It's very similar with the love of God. Even a child in our Awana program, five or six years old, could tell you about the love of God in John 3.16. And it can overwhelm and captivate their hearts because God's love is comprehensible but not in its fullness. The greatest technological advances in humankind have not allowed us to traverse the bottom of the ocean. It is unsearchable. So too, God's love is unable to be searched in its totality. It is bottomless. So why is it beyond comprehension? I think we can look at it from two angles. Because of what his love is, who he is, how he loves, and because of who I am. That he would love me. Me. You. None of us are deserving of the love of Jesus. Each of us is deserving of his judgment. And yet, he said, I do not want judgment, hell, to be the end of your story. I don't want a life in bondage to sin to be the end of your story. So he was willing to do whatever it took to lay down his life, pay the price to the fullest capacity 
to go as far as it took in his relentless pursuing love to bring you to himself. As I meditated on the love of God, I asked God to overwhelm me with his love and just begin to, to show me some, some of even just the categories of what his love is. God's love is non-contingent. It doesn't depend upon my obedience. It is unsearchable. There will always be more to know. It's never-ending and eternal. He loves us and shall love us forevermore. It is bottomless. There's always more, and as much as he pours out, he will have an infinite amount more to give. It's inexhaustible. It's not tired out by time or trial. It's faithful and committed. It will never betray us. It's otherworldly and non-reciprocal. It's not based on what we do for him. It's patient and long-suffering. He walks with us long long-term through our mistakes. He endures our imperfections. It's self-sacrificial. It's uh, willing to lay it all down for us, who were his enemies. It's constant and unwavering, unchanging and unfailing, persistent, compassionate and empathetic. He comes down and enters into our lives and our pain. It's genuine and authentic. It's others-focused. It's redeeming. It makes good from bad. It's freeing. It releases us from slavery. It's forgiving. It washes us uh, clean of all of our sins and remembers them no more. It's merciful. It's gracious. It's healing and restoring. He repairs and rebuilds what has been broken. It's pure, true, trustworthy. It's transformative and life-changing, and it is salvific. Those are just categories. Those are just categories of his love that we could study individually for the rest of eternity and never fully comprehend them. This is the love of Christ. This should overwhelm us. It should captivate us. It should be all-consuming, and it should be contagious. If we've come to know and understand and grasp and be changed by this love, then others should see it. I have to remind myself, and I think we probably all need to remind ourselves to not let familiarity drown out amazement. How many days can we go without meditating on and praising him for his love? I know what happens to me. How many weeks can we come into Sunday service and just kind of take it as, well, that's who he is. Of course he loves me. Meditate on it. Don't let a day go by without deeply pondering the love of Jesus. Read in the scripture about it. Learn more. Discuss it with others. Worship him for it. Write about it. Share it with others. So God's love, Jesus' love, is limitless. It's incomprehensible. Now let's talk about the community aspect. We cannot grasp the love of Jesus in isolation. We cannot grasp the love of Jesus in isolation. Paul tells us that we are to, by God's enabling, grasp the love of Christ with all the saints. Christian community isn't an optional part of the Christian life. Instead, This passage shows us that your very ability to grasp his love and grow in Christ-likeness is dependent upon your meaningful, genuine, and deeply rooted involvement and investment in Christian community. And this isn't just going to church on Sunday. This is about being rooted in the church body opening ourselves up to one another so that we might love imperfectly and learn from it, so that we might experience the love of Christ through one another and be changed by it. You say, Pastor, this is pretty radical. You're telling me if I'm not involved in a church community, I can't become like Jesus. Yes. This is what this passage says, and this is actually Jesus' plan. Think about it. You could live in a monastery, you could never leave the four walls of your home, and you could read the scripture and come to an intellectual 
knowledge of his love and be deeply changed by it. Absolutely. We're not denying that. But think about what Jesus' commandment was to his disciples the night before he was killed. He says this in John 13. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So Jesus doesn't say, just be loving to one another, you know, be nice to one another. He says, no, just as I have loved you with the same love that I have poured out to you, I want to pour out this love through you to your brothers and sisters. So if we are not deeply rooted in Christian community, we will not be able to love others like Jesus, and we will not receive the love of Jesus through others. Jesus loves his people through his people. Jesus didn't just come to transform your life so that individually you could have a more productive and beneficial life to society. Jesus transformed you so that you could play a vital role in his transformative community. Each of you has a role. In Ephesians, in Ephesians 4, Paul says this. He says in, in verse 10 that, that Jesus ascended and gave gifts to men. He gave some as apostles and prophets and evangelists, shepherds and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, Get this, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature, which is the fullness of Christ. This is where this whole passage is going. I want you to be mature. I want Christ to be deeply rooted in you so that he is in you in his fullness. He continues on and says this, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by trick, uh, the craftiness of deceitful scheming. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into the head who is Christ, from whom the whole body joined and, together, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Paul argues in this passage that it is by the way we love one another that the church body will grow into fullness of maturity in Jesus. Which means that two chapters in a row, he's making the argument that if you are not deeply rooted in Christian community, you will not grow into the fullness of Christ. This is essential Jesus has made us more holy, transformed us, so that we would love more holy. Let's look at this graphic really quick. This is the way that I'm conceptualizing what I'm trying to show you. There's three types of experiences of love that Jesus is trying to get us to be a part of in Christian community. We need to understand it. We need to have an intellectual knowing of his love. But by being loved, we experience the love of Christ, an experiential knowing. But then by living it out, we have a practical knowing of his love. These things all inform one another. They're, they're refined by one another. They're dependent upon one another. If you don't understand the love of Christ, you can't live it out. If you haven't experienced the love of Christ, you're not going to understand it except in a kind of theological way. And as we continue in this spiral, in a nonlinear way, understanding and experiencing and living out the love of Christ, you're going to go further and further up and get closer and closer to what the Christ's love truly looks like. By doing so, we are going to be filled up with the fullness of Christ, which is where Paul goes next. It's like a three-legged stool. Which part of your life are you experiencing or, or living into most fully, understanding the love of Christ, you say, I, I get in my scripture every day. I'm listening to podcasts. Praise God. Continue on in that. You say, I, I've really been focused on living it out. Continue in that. 
You say, I haven't been in a small group or, or, or in anything besides Sunday morning. So maybe what needs to be refined is the experiencing. You say, Pastor, you don't understand. I've experienced a lot of hurt. I'm not sure I'm ready for this. To distance ourselves from the community of Christ is to distance ourselves from the healing love of Christ. And I know church hurt. I've experienced it myself. And it hurts especially when we are not loved perfectly by believers because this is where we're to experience the love of Jesus. But if we carry on unresolved hurt, bitterness, and unforgiveness with us, if we don't love like Christ and, and forgive others and remember no more the offenses that have, have come against us, then we are going to carry the pain of our past with us into the future. If we wish for that to change, we have to sever it from our present. We can't escape what we will not let go of. Christian life is not easy because the love of Christ is not easy. To love not in reciprocity, you've done this to me, so I'll love you to the same capacity. But to say, I'm going to love you because that is who Jesus is and who he has made me. That is the love of Jesus. How are you living into this? I... Uh, I'd love for each of you to be a part of our small group ministry. And we're getting to that time of year where we're about to get it revved up and going again. So maybe you say, I'm ready to jump in. I want to get in the small group. I want to get in the men's study or women's study. I've got my number up here right now. So I'm the one who does placements in the small group. So if that's you, don't wait till there's a table in the gym. My number's right here. Shoot me a text. I would love to get you involved deeply in the community of believers we have here. And I promise you, you will not be disappointed. We have a small group over at our house every Thursday, and it's truly family. It's amazing to see the bonds that have happened in the past year, the transformation that has happened in the past year, the change that has happened, people who were hurt previously and, and have been healed, have come to trust and forgive. Would love for you to be a part of that, too. Our last point is this. So Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, wants to radically transform and redirect our lives so that we might understand, experience, and live out his love in Christian community. Here's the last result. And thus, be conformed to and reflect who he is in a godless world. We must not be content to live an ordinary life. If you don't want to live an ordinary life, the rest of your life, then you must be filled up more and more to the fullness of Christ. This happens by the transformative power of his spirit. This happens by loving and being loved within Christian community. How full of Jesus are you today? If I were to tell you, I am filled fully with Jesus, I would be full of it. <laughs> it's just not true. There's a lot of me that's still left that he's working on. But if you were to honestly take an assessment of your life, if Jesus were here today and he sat you down and said, hey, you know, Stephen, where, where am I filling your life? Where, where are you pouring me out in your life to others? Let's go through this list of my love. How are you doing with forgiveness? How are you doing with mercy? How are you doing with uh, love that is not reciprocal? How filled with Jesus would we truly be? The most important thing is that we know where we are. If we're convinced that we are fine as we are and have no need to improve, then we never will. This is why Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Do you guys get hungry, thirsty, 
It's because you need food and water every day, right? If you don't, then you're dead. You'll stop being hungry, you'll stop being thirsty. As people who have been made spiritually alive, been made alive from spiritual death, we should hunger and thirst for righteousness because until we are glorified when Jesus brings us home, we will not yet be fully there. Jesus died so that he could make us more like him. He has made us more holy so that we might love more holy with a W and be filled more fully. Paul says this in Romans 8, 28. We know that God works all things together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, what's his purpose? Jesus saved us, we believe in him, and we get to heaven, right? It's, it's more than that. He wants life transformation for us now. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God doesn't want us to just wait till we get to heaven to be like Christ. He wants to make us more and more like him day by day. You see, this is, this is the whole trajectory of what we would call redemptive history. In the beginning, when God created man and woman, he created them what? In his image. So Adam and Eve, by no means divine, but reflect fully the character of God because they were without sin. They were made in his image, and so when you saw God, Adam and Eve were a reflection of who he was. But what happens when sin enters in? We'll call the worship team up here as well. Sin enters in. I hope you can see the difference in color. But we no longer reflected or reflect now fully the image of God. So what does God have to do? Because he's not content with that. He doesn't want that to be the end of the story. He sends his son into the world who is the perfect representation of the Father so that our lives would be changed and that as we become more and more like Jesus, as he fills us more and more, we're not just what we once were. One day he'll make us like this again, but his plan is to continue to fill us so that we in this life would be more and more like him. And one day he will put us, make us fully like him when we are glorified in heaven. But I wonder where each of us is today in this journey. Maybe you're just beginning your journey, and there's a lot of work for him to do. Praise God, you know what? He's able to do it. <laughs> you know, he says right after this, he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we could ask or think. You know, his love is not just limitless. His power is limitless. No matter what it is that you're struggling with, he is powerful enough to break those chains in your life. And we do it not just so that people would think that we're better than others, because we're certainly not. Walk around with me for a couple of days and you'll realize, really when it comes down to it, I'm, I'm just a normal person. We all are. But we're normal people who have an extraordinary God within us so that our lives are supernatural, extraordinary, otherworldly, so that when people see us, they don't just see us. They see him. When Jesus came in the fullness of the image of God, the fullness of deity dwelled in him bodily, John 1.18 says, no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God was in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him, manifested him, revealed him. Jesus made the invisible God visible. And so, too, when Jesus lives through you, to the degree that you are full of him, and you pour him out of you, to that same degree do you manifest the living God and make the invisible God visible 
to a world who is without him and cannot see him. So are you ready to go into this world and shine the light of Christ? I pray that you are. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and just beg that you would do an incredible work in us. Lord, all of us are works in progress, but Lord, all of us are moving forward because we have you. Lord, I pray that we would live into who you are, live into your calling. Deeply root us in this community, Lord. You have blessed us with such an incredible group of people. I, my family, we all have been so blessed by the people at Anchor Church, Lord. It's not just the building, it's the people. Lord, continue to do so. Change us through one another. Love us through one another so that we might be more like you and the world might see you more through us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.